Уважаемые коллеги, добрый день. Сегодня мы проводим вебинар из серии встреч. Today we are holding a webinar, one of the series of webinars for professionals in palliative care. At the end of this webinar, I will speak about that in more detail. Today's webinar is dedicated to relevant state status of things related to palliative care in Kazakhstan and also palliative care competence center that was launched in Kazakhstan last year and which now holds an important place in palliative care in Kazakhstan. A couple, a couple of technicalities. Today's webinar is held in Russian. However, if you prefer listening to it in English, then you will find the globe icon in the lower part of the Zoom panel. You can click on it and switch to English. That's listening to the webinar in the language which is convenient for you. We have interpreters working with us today, Anastasia Pedega and Anna Kmaiva. My name is Ira Chernozhukova. I represent the Based Fund, the Foundation for Palliative Care Education. We are a chari charitable foundation that supports palliative care specialists in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. We support them in acquiring knowledge and exchange experiences. I will moderate today's webinar. Thank you very much for having joined. In the second part of the webinar, you will be able to ask speakers your questions. For that, please use the function raise your hand. You will also find it in reactions in the lower part of Zoom. And when we see your hand, we will allow you to activate your microphone. If you have a comment or a question while speakers are speaking, you will be able to use the chat of our webinar and write your questions there. We'll make sure to take them after speakers finish presenting. Let me introduce our distinguished speakers. Gulnara Kunirova. Gulnara, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hello. Thank you very much. Gulnara is president of the Kazakhstan Palliative Care Association, chief specialist in palliative care of the Ministry of Health of the Republic of Kazakhstan. Sabila Shugelova. Sabila, hello. Hello, colleagues. Sabila is co-founder and director of the public fund Emergisen, which is translated as Believe in Life. Natalia Sava. Natalia, hello. Natalia, with name. Natalia, are you there? Natalia, у вас звук, наверное, выключен. Your microphone is on mute, I guess. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Hello. Natalia Sava, PhD, associate professor, expert at the Respiratory Support and Palliative Care Competence Center of the Omergesen Char Charitable Foundation. Norbek Bakidov. Norbek, hello. Hello. Norbek is an anesthesiologist resuscitated at the Respiratory Support and Palliative Care Competence Center. And Shirin Amantaeva. Shirin? Hello. Hello. Shirin is a nurse at the Respiratory Support and Palliative Care Competence Center. Uh, I would like to remind you once again that you'll be able to address the speakers and you can write questions in the chat of the webinar. I want to thank all the participants and I hope that our webinar will be very useful. 
we will make sure to send the recording of the webinar and all the materials to the participants. Please note that we have a Telegram chat based for palliative care professionals. The chat will moderate, and there we publish all announcements of our events, as well as the most interesting materials from the palliative care world. And then the most useful of them get into our monthly digest. If you want to join the paste Telegram chat, then please look at the link to a little Google form in the Zoom chat. Please fill it in for us to be able to add you to the chat and to present you correctly to your colleagues, to palliative care professionals. Now I'm giving the floor to President of Kazakhstan Association of Palliative Care, Chief Specialist in Palliative Care in the Republic of Kazakhstan, Mulnara Komilova. Mulnara, over to you. Hello, dear participants, distinguished participants of today's webinar. First of all, I would like to thank the PACE team, Natalia, Sava as well, for the idea of holding this webinar, for having organized it. All based webinars are always very interesting and informative. I'm happy that we have this resource now. The colleagues in the region have access to it. I will try to briefly describe the situation related to palliative care in Kazakhstan as of today. And I would like to start with the following. Children's palliative care as a system, or with the meaning that we attribute to it in countries where it is developed, is absent in Kazakhstan. We are just starting to gather information to analyze it, where children are that need palliative care, how many of them there are, what children they are, which resources we have, that can support them. And on the next slide, you can see the map, Kazakhstan map. Administratively, it is divided into 17 regions and three cities of Republican, meaning Republican importance. For the moment, we don't have a register of palliative care children. However, creation of such a register is part of a roadmap of development of palliative care until 2024. Let's please remain on that slide. It is included in the roadmap. The roadmap was accepted last year until 2024. And last year, for the first time, the roadmap was accepted for developing of children's palliative care. Most of this roadmap is devoted to collection of information, estimation of needs, analysis of regulations. We don't have the register, so we have to count on worldwide hospice and palliative care alliance. And according to that, as of today, about 5,000 children need specialized palliative care. The red numbers that you see on the map they are beds that are called palliative beds in the system of the national medical uh, health care. We have identified that the, we have very few of them, 54 only. And they are mostly situated in uh, children's city or regional hospitals. We have a department of palliative care with 10 beds in children's a clinical hospital in Shenzhen City where there are children with severe neuromuscular diseases. Unfortunately, we cannot speak of fullness and adequateness of palliative care when we have so few beds. As for specialized mobile pros, it's not available now either. If children need help at home, then there's nurses and pediatricians that go and provide them that help. And we have decided, we have, we have started to work on organization of patronage work. It is only 
accessible to oncological patients of the fourth group in Kazakhstan. Of course, we will need to train this personnel. Thus, this process will take some more time. Next slide, please. According to data that we obtained from the Ministry of Healthcare, in 2022, only 365 children received palliative care in the Republic of Kazakhstan. We are speaking about this so-called palliative beds. In 2022, we were given information about the number of treated cases, 692. Thus, we can see that about 7% of children only received help. And children that need palliative care, they're mostly at home or they are in ITU units. They're also in children's facilities or in centers of social services for disabled children. One of such centers where there are so-called palliative groups and where long-term care is provided to children with psychoneurological diseases. Natalia and I, we went to one of it yesterday. Centers of social services do not belong to the medical system. They belong to the system of social protection of the population. There is no separate standard for a palliative care for children. There is just a section in the general standard organization of palliative care to the population. And this standard will be re-examined within the roadmap, including the section dedicated to children's help. We don't have separate clinical protocols or clinical guidelines, as they're called in other countries, guidelines concerning children's palliative care. We included them in the list of priorities starting from last year, from next year. Will they be part of protocols for separate nosologies or will they be mentioned separately? It is something we are working on now. It is on our agenda. We only have clinical protocols inside oncological health protocols for children. We don't have them for other, other nosologists. But the saddest fact is that we have no single children's doctor that would have been trained in specialized palliative care for children. As for state provision with devices like oxygen supply devices and others, different consumables, then it's not available at home either. If a child is disabled, then there is an individual program of rehabilitation made for them, and they receive diapers and wheelchairs and a number of social benefits and advantages. However, as for medical facilities, this problem of a provision of the necessary devices, it is solved as a part of, as percentage of children's benefit packages. So the significant financial burden lies on the children's families and on non-governmental organizations. Next slide, please. Fortunately, there are several active NGOs that don't wait for grace from state and that make their contribution into development of palliative care. For example, the foundation Healthy Asia, in 2009, they created a children's hospice, I'm with you, for 18 beds. And they have a mobile crew as well. This hospice is near Almaty. And for the moment, it is the only one in Kazakhstan. And the foundation Omerkesen that will present today respiratory support and palliative care center that provides help to more than 500 children with neuromuscular diseases. We also have an association of palliative care to children's population of Kazakhstan. Today they provide practical help to children in Karaganda region. They support Elmati Children's Hospice. And currently they are conducting research in Karaganda region. When this research is finished, I guess we will learn a lot of, a lot of interesting things that will add to 
our overall understanding of the status of palliative care in Kazakhstan. And the foundation Amela, our long time partner, they provide psychosocial accompanying of children, of families, where there are children with oncological diseases. These associations, they are like pieces of puzzle without which it would not be possible to create a holistic system of palliative care in the country. All projects are different, they are very important and very valuable in their own way. And the next slide. We don't yet have solid research in palliative care. There is a WHO research of 2019, which is called ADAPT, evaluation of doctors' attitude to palliative care. It was conducted to evaluate the level of knowledge of doctors and of access to palliative care. And doctors' perception about integration of palliative care for children with oncological diseases in accordance with WHO guidelines. 424 respondents took part in the research from 24 countries. And the share of responses from Kazakhstan was 75%. Next slide, please. According to that research, 75% of doctors say that they don't have access to consulting on palliative care in their practice. 72% of doctors specified that consulting for palliative care is not available. Well, in their opinion, they are necessary for children that have oncological diseases. 38% of doctors think that palliative care was involved too late to treat a child with an oncological disease. And you can see on the map that about 80% of doctors in Kazakhstan said that palliative care to children was not available. 70% of doctors think that palliative care reduces a child's sufferings if they have an oncological disease. And 68% of doctors think that palliative care should be integrated in treatment of oncological children earlier than what is the regular practice in their medical facilities. Kazakhstan doctors said that absence of home care and limited access to specialized palliative care, as well as resistance of a family, are the most serious obstacles for providing fully fledged palliative care to children with oncological diseases. The positive sides of this research are the following. Doctors are highly motivated to get broader training in palliative care to children. That was the answer of 98% of doctors. And there is deep understanding of the existing barriers to integration of palliative care in the system of medical here in Kazakhstan. And on that, I want to give the floor on to other speakers. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Gulnara. Sibila, over to you. Dear colleagues, good afternoon once again. I'd like to thank all the participants and the organizers of this event. I believe it's uh, quite important to organize such workshops and webinars and to share our experience. So let's uh, take a look at my slides. Today I'd like to talk about our foundation, Omerge Sen. We support patients with uh, neuromuscular diseases such as uh, spinal muscular atrophy, also the Duchenne muscular dystrophy and other types of dystrophies. And our foundation also takes care of uh, the light diseases among our patients, those that are suffer from neuromuscular diseases. Today, we take care of 530 patients in our foundation. And more than 450 those patients are already young adults. 
or to be more precise, about 450 patients of ours are children and the rest are adults. Um, people over 18 years. Well, now you can see the statistics on the orphan diseases uh, because those are the most diseases that are genetically based. And uh, up to 300 nosologists out of those are neuromuscular diseases. And uh, the incidence here is one case per 3,500 people in our population. With these stats, we can try to project and predict how many people will need palliative care uh, in the field of neuromuscular diseases. Because up until some age, our patients are not included into the group of uh, palliative care patients. However, in any case, we support them in this way as well. And in our center, they can get also consultations. I'll elaborate on that a bit later. Could you please go to the next slide? And so I'd like to talk about our work as it is. We have a, a very clear organizational structure in our foundation. In all the regions of uh, Kazakhstan, which are about 20, we have the representatives of our foundation. And uh, those are active parents of uh, children with neuromuscular diseases. And our foundation, Nirgisen, was created with the close participation from parents uh, of such children. I'm also an aunt of uh, a child with a Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And in all the regions, we have our representatives that uh, conduct work uh, locally. This could be the organization of uh, events, maybe meeting the authorities, the executive authorities. And uh, it's very important that we work as a team and we do understand what we are working for. Our work started, and we will see this on the next slide. We've uh, already been working for more than five years and our first steps were in the field of education to involve professionals from other countries to train doctors within a multidisciplinary approach. We invited professionals from different fields to train our professionals from different regions because we had to understand what are neuromuscular diseases, what approaches exist in this field. Of course, here we talk about uh, respiratory support, and of course, we involve neurologists and rehabilitologists and resuscitators in this work. So here you can see photos from different events that we organized. And on the next slide, you probably see the same portion of information. I won't stop here for a long time because we are quite uh, pressed for time. And uh, if we talk about the workshops in particular, for example, this is a conference where we invited a neurologist, a cardiologist and a pulmonologist. We took advantage of uh, inviting them to uh, take to the conference, to take part in the conference in Kazakhstan. So they came to Kazakhstan offline and we took advantage of that and we invited those uh, professionals to our center. At that time, we didn't have our office in place yet to organize visits. And on this slide, uh, you can see our professionals. Uh, we also organized um, uh, quite a large event in uh, Shimkent. Here you can see 
that our patients undercover also need uh, under care, also need the respiratory devices, uh, ventilators. Those are quite uh, expensive pieces of equipment and quite often families cannot buy it uh, themselves. And in these cases, we organize fundraising. We also involve sponsors for some targeted uh, fundraising. With this mobile equipment, parents can take care of their children at home. And on the next slide, I wanted actually to show you a slide where we show how we work. So on the 1st of uh, June, 2022, we opened the uh, Center uh, of Respiratory Support and Palliative Care. We organize uh, offline and online consult consultations. We also organize some schools uh, locally in the regions uh, for families with neuromuscular diseases. Uh, we organized a celebration, an opening ceremony, because that was the 1st of June. We invited our sponsors to participate. We invited the doctors and we organized a round table. We invited deputies to come. And uh, at this opening, we announced our roadmap, our plans. We also invited our children. We organized uh, some treats for the guests. It's actually all started with a, a Zoom conference that was organized by uh, the head of one of the sponsors' organizations. So, Natalia uh, Sava also participated uh, in this webinar for uh, patients in Kazakhstan, those that need uh, palliative care. And after this webinar, I learned that Natalia uh, will be in Kazakhstan for quite some time now, Natalia Sava. And uh, I learned that she is um, relocating from Russia uh, temporarily. And the same day, we discussed it with our colleagues and we decided that uh, I need to meet with Natalia. And we made it happen in Astana. Our center is located in Almata, but uh, Natalia was in, uh, in Astana. So we met and we discussed our matters, our issues, and it all worked out. I'm very thankful to Natalia Sava. And uh, I would like to give the floor to her now, and she can give you more details on how we were creating and establishing our foundation and about our future plans. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Natalia, uh, the floor is yours. As far as I understand, you have some problems with the connection, so you will switch off your camera, right? Natalia, unfortunately, we can't hear you. Yes, now we can hear you. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the invitation. Could you please go back to the slide with our timeline? Yes. Thank you. So I'll uh, continue and follow up on what Sabela mentioned. So the Center of Respiratory Support and Palliative Care, uh, based uh, on the Omergesen Foundation, uh, was created in actually three months. And so this preparatory stage started with the, indeed a meeting and uh, the public foundation Omergesen, it's uh, the foundation that uh, involves parents. They established it. The founders of uh, this foundation are the parents or relatives of uh, the patients themselves. And so the, they were very interested not only in targeted support for children, not only in uh, requesting the medicines for um, uh, 
the spinal muscular atrophy and for Duchenne dystrophy. But uh, also another goal was to extend the life uh, of patients to provide the systematic support. And uh, well, here we united our efforts with uh, Sabila. And uh, when uh, she suggested that we could organize uh, such a systematic approach, and then first we came up with the idea of organizing the center of competence and then getting the license for the Center for Respiratory Support and Palliative Care. So we started with the competence center and we moved towards the medical center. And to establish this center, to start it all, of course, I had to uh, get familiar with the situation in Kazakhstan and Sibylla invited me to come to Almata and uh, we visited some organizations, we met with Gulnara, and well, I saw that there are some very interested people that are united by the same idea. And for me, it was very important to actually see and meet the people with whom we could start. Uh, that's how I realized that uh, I believed in that. So I applied, uh, I drafted the application for the uh, grant, Sibylla found the uh, finance for this and that's how we actually got the grant and uh, that's how we got the finance to invite professionals and to pay the salary and uh, we had the approval for a six month course a six month project and this application is continuously reapplied and uh, if you have any questions in the end I think Sibylla will answer so I was ready to establish this foundation, this center, even based um, in the office of the foundation itself. So uh, they have a very nice um, space in the center of the city uh, and we could start from that point as well. But when we understood that we were getting the financing for this, Sabila found a very nice uh, space also in the center of the city near the park of Pamphilovci. So children can also just come there and take a walk. And uh, we were actually very lucky with this space because we managed to adapt uh, these rooms uh, towards uh, the um, children in uh, wheelchairs. So we organized all that was necessary. And so by the opening ceremony, we adapted this uh, space. Uh, it's very nice. You can see the park uh, from the window of this uh, uh, office of ours now. So I was very delighted because uh, indeed I was inspired by the interest coming from all the people. And so on the 1st of June, um, the, uh, with the, on the Children's Day, we opened uh, the center Initially, we called it the competence center because we didn't have the respiratory support and palliative care yet. Uh, first, we planned to train parents in um, some competences to organize uh, schools to inform on the diseases, on what we can do at different stages, what equipment is available. And after that, we wanted to get the license for respiratory support and palliative care also to provide the medical consultations. So we started with a competence center that didn't require us to obtain any medical licenses. And uh, then on the 1st of June, uh, we organized a summer school in Almata, and then we continued the same work in different regions in Kazakhstan. Uh, this is free of charge uh, with the um, offline and uh, online format. Uh, so we invited our professionals to come offline and also online we invited the caregivers and in July 2022 we started individual trainings uh, within which we were informing the patients that was also in a hybrid format. Uh, because we have our patients across the whole country across the whole Kazakhstan. Um, the they are both um, children and adults. Our oldest patient is uh, 35, 36 years. And in uh, July 2022, we got the permission to actually uh, support uh, our patients in a respiratory way. So we could start our medical 
activities and then the nurse and the doctor that we hired they didn't only train and talk about this but they also uh, provided medical consultations and um, uh, the checkups uh, for those patients that uh, need needed in Kazakhstan and uh, in September and uh, December from September to December, we were drafting the application for the financing in 2023. We got it. So now we work within this uh, grant. And uh, next um, steps for us is uh, Sabla is working on this. Uh, we continuously doing the fundraising to continue the work of our foundation. And so here you can see the opening of the center. And so here you can see the two founders of the foundation, Asad and Sabela. They're very much interested, very helping uh, people, very caring. And so uh, this foundation also involves a lot of parents on a daily basis. And uh, sometimes when we organize events, uh, we also get help from the parents of children and it's always very beautiful. We also had some uh, pastry. Uh, actually, the parents uh, of children made those pastries. And uh, of course, when we talk about the team, um, you know that this is uh, the most important element because we can have money, we can have equipment, but uh, Sometimes we can lack professionals that will make use uh, of uh, this infrastructure that would be professional in um, uh, consultations and training. And uh, well, of course, in Kazakhstan, um, we didn't have that many professionals who would have experience in um, supporting children in a palliative way, especially in the field of neuromuscular diseases. So we had to start from scratch and we had to find such professional. We um, had Use with a couple of uh, um, rehabilitologists and re resuscitators, and we found Nurbek um, Bahitov, a resuscitator, and uh, later he became the head of the center. It was very important for us to have a full-time doctor. Uh, it was very important for us to have this person from morning till evening, five days per week. So we uh, started to train him in palliative care and uh, support. Together with him, with, we were also training the families of our patients. So it was an internship for uh, Nurbek. Um, he has a very extensive experience in working in ICU and uh, in um, different kind of clinics. And for him, getting this experience in palliative care wasn't a very difficult task, but at the same time, it took some time. And of course, we, need, we had to find a person who would be easy to train, motivated, ready to absorb new knowledge. And so we've established uh, very good relations with uh, this professional, with uh, uh, Nurbek. And now I can tell you that he can actually start training professionals in Kazakhstan already. Here we see that we started with live consultations at the center, consultations at home and remote consultations. And we provided consultation to caregivers, uh, to professionals, to specialists, and just to those who wanted to know what specifically could be done. Of course, not parents understood right from the start why the center had been opened. We had to go through that stage. Who are you? Why do we need you? Are you a neurologist? Are you a pulmonologist? And who is a palliative care specialist? And in the first several months, we had to kind of impose ourselves on the people. We talked about ourselves, we called people, we made acquaintance, and we overcame that barrier of acquaintance after which people started to get signed up. And now everyone understands why we are there, what for. And when we employed a nurse, Shreyam, she was signing people up for consultations. She also explains to parents which questions we answer, which examinations we do, and how we can help families. We were looking for a nurse. We did not find Shireen straight away. It is another like-minded person in the team, very smart, very kind very ready to help. 
and she mastered everything that we wanted to pass on to a respiratory nurse. And now she is able to teach others as well, both professionals and parents who do examinations. And this interreplaceability in the team, it is something that can be felt. Me and Rebecca, Sharon, they are people that can train others, ambiotherapy, examinations, and even give lectures. Since January, we've had children's neurologist, and we also invited Vasily Sergeyevich, his pediatric intensive care therapist, because, you know, question of administering a specific therapy, it is something to be done by neurologists, I mean, curative therapy. And Vasily Sergeyevich will continue to train Asher and Rebecca train them respiratory support because I provide the basis. And when people have mastered the basis in six months, then he trained particularities of respiratory support for our patients. He helped correct parameters of the COFA and so on. And we are very grateful to him for that. In January, we had psychologists join in. It is a separate project that also received its financing. These four psychologists started to work with parents and with adolescents. Next. Now the team of the Respiratory Support and Palliative Care Center is that big. Apart from psychologists, we have head of the center, Norbek Makitov. I am now an expert. I consult children, and we discuss some strategic things with Sabila and with Nurbek. Vasily Sergeyevich helps to consult children as an expert. Aynora Bekitaeva is a pediatric neurologist. Sharon is a nurse, and Laura, that is with us from day one, is a manager that helped us with all administrative issues. Next. And here you see our team. Next. Next, please. Equipment of the center. Of course, you can start with consultations and with training. You can do that without any equipment. And actually, if we wanted to start not when you have everything, it's not possible to wait for everything, to have everything. You can start having nothing apart from your brain and like-minded people on the team. And that is how we started, just having our brains and like-minded people on the team. And then gradually we acquired the equipment that we needed. And a huge thank you to Sabila. She always understood that that was needed. We started with the internet. We had many remote consultations. That is why we bought equipment for internet broadcast, for internet connection. Then we also bought equipment for medical examinations to examine children with neuromuscular diseases. It is unique equipment for Kazakhstan. And now we have a cathometer and pulse oximeter and other equipment necessary for diagnosis and for providing respiratory care at home. Next. Everyone got trained. And now all employees, Norbeck and Asherin, they can put this equipment on correctly on the patient. Next. If we did not manage to invite specialists and professionals for training, we used remote mode. We did not wait for people to join us physically. We agreed on other formats. And for example, we, we learned to use a hypnometer remotely at the beginning. As for consumables for training and to distribute it to patients, we were given those consumables, and one of the founders of the foundation had 
quite a lot of stock and he brought all of that into the center. We really needed toys because families are big in Kazakhstan. They come with patients and with siblings, brothers, sisters. It was very important for us to have many toys. We asked children, we asked parents in the chat to share what they did not need anymore. And they brought a lot of different toys. We're very grateful for that as well. And there is another huge problem in Kazakhstan. It's not yet been solved. A proper rehabilitation means for neuromuscular children. It exists for uh, cerebral palsy, but it is not yet manufactured for neuromuscular diseases. So we asked everyone to share orthesis and braces for children with neuromuscular diseases. We understand that they're all individually manufactured devices. However, if you have nothing, you're grateful to have even that. So we try to provide it to children until they get their own customized ones. Here you see a chart with SMA. We examine him on the left. There is equipment put on him in the center. And then that kid will go home with that equipment. And it turned out that we had orthesis for ankle joints that fit very well. And he actually went home wearing those orth orthesis. And then we started to acquire something that was not urgent, but was important as well. Scales and devices to measure height. We also have a dream uh, to have something for children in wheelchairs, those who cannot use the regular scales. Hopefully we'll get them in the future. And there are some small things which are pleasant and which create a good atmosphere. It's important to have it, to have them in the center as well. It is absence of white doctor's goons, fish in the aquarium, and Masha and bears. It is where children ask to play when we run consultations, because a consultation runs for one or two hours. And of course, we need to occupy kids with books, with cartoons and so on. We have that possibility now. Children that could not sit by themselves, we did not have money straight away to buy everything and to buy the correct equipment. We were given this chair and children love sitting in it, drawing and watching TV, those who can, of course. Another big activity of ours, monthly off-site schools and roundtables. We started in Elmati and then it was Astana and then we made a tour of other regions. It's important because we meet with doctors, we understand what their problems are. We meet with the regional authorities officials, and it is like a mission. You tell them that we are there, we exist. Please refer patients to us. It's all free. Use, use this opportunity. And our next task, if we can, will be growing capacity of such centers in regions for children not to have to come to us physically, but to have the possibility to get examined on the spot. If we could, we brought equipment for examination in the region a capnometer, for example, we cannot bring it there. We cannot move it around. That is why uh, capnometry is only done for children who can physically get to our center. It is not yet done in the regions. And training of parents and consulting children, we carry that out as well. Usually the school is accompanied by consultations and examinations of patients. Next. And something I'm really proud of. I was the lecturer in the first school. But then Nurbek, Shurem, Ainur joined, and even Vasily Sergeyevich was a lecturer in one of the schools. And schools became with a mixed language. First, it was Russian language school, but as many parents and professionals, they speak the Kazakh language in Kazakhstan. Now, 
we don't only have the Russian language uh, in the school, but we also have Kazakh speaking lecturers, which is really great. And a huge thank you to the team that prepared the school that is not only composed of uh, professionals of the center, but also parents and coordinators of the foundation and regions. The families, they agree on the venue, they prepare the venue for the school, they check the equipment, the halls, they organize round tables, they talk to authorities, they organize coffee breaks, they take on all that organizational work. It is done by parents and coordinators of the foundation. They work as volunteers. A huge thank you to them for that. Here you see a letter. It is our letter to Almaty. We always write such letters, not just to come to a place to read a lecture and leave, but for it to be an important event in the region. We invite professionals via the Department of Medical Care in the region, and we ask to organize a business trip. And they can go to the school and not have to rush around to do their own things, which is often the case for doctors. They have to select whether they go to a school or to a different place. So they have an official business travel for that, which helps us a lot. Here you see an approximate curriculum, the program that we send for people to understand what questions we cover. For the moment, all schools are composed of two parts. We speak about importance of nutritive support and the importance of respiratory support. Two big, vast problems that palliative children and children with neuromuscular diseases have. Next. As I have said, each school in the region means consulting children. We also started to get to people's homes and hospitals, not only in Almaty, but also in regions. Next. They are mostly children with neuromuscular diseases, of course, or with suspicion that they have such a disease. Such a disease. Next, please. This is one of the regions, the hospital, where we consulted and trained professionals after the school. Next. A very important part of our work is informing work, awareness work. This awareness work happens at meetings with authorities. We speak about the center and we speak about the necessity uh, to provide palliative care to children. Shabila has personal contacts as well. It is when she herself or her acquaintances agree on our being accepted and welcomed, because you cannot just come there and say, hello, it's me, you won't be able to. However, when you already have support and when you bring ideas and you make acquaintance, then, of course, it can help organize the event, and then you can maintain those contacts in the future. We started presenting about this center. We started to do that in conferences, both remotely and in person. We try not to miss those conferences. Norbeck and Shirin go there, and I presented there as well. If we managed to, we spoke about ourselves and about the importance of palliative care on media and on regional TV. I 
and schools were run partially in the Kazakh language. So all doctors of the center were speakers, and those who were not going there uh, were able to provide lectures remotely. Here, for example, we have one or two speakers who arrived there, physically, and the others join on Zoom. They can also present remotely. These listeners, for example, they attend in a physical, in an in-person and remote format. Thus, we save money, but at the same time, we can physically come and speak about important topics. Each such school, each such event is an important event. We inform people of what palliative care is, what the palliative center is, and how we can cooperate with pediatricians and those who work in medical facilities. Next, here is Shirin presenting at such a school, and we joined remotely. And here you see a year of work of the center in some figures. We opened in June, and there was big organizational work carried out and search for specialists. Starting with July, we started to receive patients in person. We started to train professionals in person as well. It means that we went uh, to a clinic or somebody came to our facility, and we had remote consultations of patients, care providers, and there was also awareness work with them. We were training specialists. And then starting with January, in-person and remote consultations of psychologists also were also added on the list. And that's the number of patients and uh, caregivers and professionals has grown. So you see the total here. Now, nutritive and respiratory support schools, they are also held every month. In total, over the year, from the moment of opening of the center, we opened we had 11 schools, we visited 11 regions of the country. The number of professionals uh, who visited our schools in person, it was 647. As for care givers that attended remotely, there were 242 of them. And now I would like to give the floor to Nurbek and to Shirin. For them to speak about what their work consists of, what they do specifically, what Norbeck does and what Shirin does. Norbeck, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Thank you. So, how I started, or what did I do before working? in the foundation. I worked in uh, clinics and hospitals in surgical units and uh, uh, with patients. And uh, so I was invited to join the foundation as the resuscitator and uh, anesthesiologist. So first, uh, it was um, quite unusual for me to work with such patients. I started my work in July. Uh, as the resuscitator and uh, anesthesiologist. So I worked together with uh, Natalia and I learned a lot from her. She taught me a lot how to take care of children with uh, neuromuscular diseases, how to work with them, how to organize the respiratory support for these children. As I said, I learned a lot from her. When I got some practice, I started to organize the trainings and uh, giving consultations myself to parents. So in our center, we support patients with neuromuscular diseases. We offer consultations both online and offline. 
online consultations are given to those patients that live in other cities and uh, offline consultations are for those who can come and visit our center. We consult on respiratory support, on nutritional support and uh, on palliative care. Uh, we also train parents how to take care of their patients as a nurse, because if um, some patients have some special equipment, uh, like tracheostoma or gastroestoma, uh, we also train parents how to take care of such children. So we train, as I said, both offline and offline, how to behave in critical crisis situations, for example, if uh, a child has some problems with breathing or maybe if uh, some external element got into the breathing uh, airways of children, we train parents how to act in these situations. We also train them how to work with the ABU bag or bag valve mask. We tell them how to work with the artificial ventilators, how to switch it on, switch it off, how to clean it, how to sanitize it. And uh, we train our parents how to do all this. In our center, one can get uh, a checkup different types of uh, checkups. You can also get a checkup in the field of uh, um, capnometry and many others. So when our patients undergo the checkups, then uh, we can see the results of those. And after these results, we can decide whether there is any necessity in respiratory support or not. For example, if we take a look at the daily results of the oxygen uh, content in the body, uh, we can decide whether a child or the patient needs a ventilator or not. Maybe he or she needs a special mask, a nasal mask, um, oral mask. Now, we decide what the patient needs and then we also train parents how to work with this equipment how to sanitize it how to take care of it we also organize all the settings for these pieces of equipment we also organize visits together with the shiren if there is a necessity if we have a patient who is in a crisis situation or if there is a real need for an offline consultation, we can pay this visit. We can offer our consultation offline. And if it's needed, then we can reset the ventilator or the bags, the respiratory bags. And we also tell parents how to continue to take care of their children. What we also done, we organized a couple of schools outgoing schools in different cities. Natalia taught us how to conduct a school training. That was uh, the first experience for me. I learned a lot. Natalia gave me some foundational knowledge in the field of respiratory support. And then Vasily joined us. He's also uh, a uh, resuscitator, resuscitator from Moscow. And uh, he trained me some in some specifics of uh, the respiratory support. So when I started to work here, I learned a lot. And uh, currently, I also train uh, resuscitators in Almata myself. I train those who don't know how to work with uh, some uh, domestic ventilators how to set them up, how to work with masks, how to work with breathing bags. So that's how we work in our center.
Нурбек, thank you very much. Shirin, maybe you could also add a little bit on your work in the center. Yes, uh, good afternoon once again. So we have our schedule of work for doctors and uh, in accordance with this schedule, I call our patients or they can call me if they want to have a consultation. They can do it offline, online, it doesn't matter. They can also make an appointment with our neurologist and with our psychologists. Uh, they can also make an appointment for Natalia and Nurbek. We also organize joint uh, consultations uh, with uh, multiple doctors. So a patient comes, can come to our center to do the diagnostics, to do the checkup. Uh, we also can organize the uh, pulse oximetry, the, we can use a Kapno meter and uh, many other equipment. We also have a special software to interpret the results of those checkups and to store the data. I also take measurements of our patients' height, uh, weight, uh, also the some indicators such as saturation, such as pulse and uh, the frequency of uh, breathing. We also have a special table to which we can add the results uh, after each of the consultations. Our doctors can issue some sum up after the checkup or after a consultation and we can give it out to our patients as well. And if we have online patients, then we make an appointment for them. And the, the majority of uh, questions can be actually resolved uh, in an online format, especially if a patient can't visit us. If I visit patients at home, then um, I do it with a doctor. And uh, if it's needed, then we can also do some diagnostics uh, at home. Our consultation lasts uh, from 1.5 to 2 hours. One hour is needed to get to know the patient better, to ask about the history of the disease, some uh, recent tests, some recent checkups, and then I send it to the consulting doctor. And then if it's an online consultation, the doctor will read all this and then call the patient back. After the consultation, the summary will be issued, and then I can send this summary to our patient in PDF format or via email. And so the results of these uh, diagnostics, I also sent could be sent um, on WhatsApp. And uh, since March, we started to cooperate with the uh, Yandex company. They can, they offer us a free of charge uh, taxi services. Our employees or our patients can use this offer. And so I accept all the applications in the whole Kazakhstan regarding this. And monthly, as it was said, we organize schools in different regions in Kazakhstan. I'm also a speaker in these schools. We show our respiratory equipment, we show our diagnostics equipment to the professionals who are the participants of the school. We also train how to work with the AMBU bag and we also show how to actually uh, put uh, the equipment on, I mean the diagnostics equipment, because not all the regions of Kazakhstan have um, these samples. Shirin, thanks a lot. Uh, as far as I understood, uh, you are like the contact person for the patients. And uh, the fact that you're very flexible, meaning that uh, you can talk offline, online, you can visit a patient, you can receive a patient in your center. I think that's very nice. And uh, well, uh, we see a very high quality of your work with your patients. Thank you very much for what you're doing. So, distinguished colleagues, distinguished speakers, thank you very much. Thank you for your professionalism, thanks to which the center actually 
was established and it seems to me that the process of establishing of the center in such a short term it's quite a unique case and uh, you can use it as a model a role model and as far as uh, i understand you are already trying to integrate it into the regions in kazakhstan and this is i think a very good model to actually use in uh, different countries later on to increase the quality level of the palliative care in those countries so um distinguished audience distinguished participants Please, if you have any questions, then you can uh, click the button, raise the hand in Zoom. I'm sure you will have some questions because we had a very logical and extensive presentation. And I think that today we are presented with a unique opportunity uh, to ask the founders of this um, center um, for some details, how they managed all this, and you can use it later in your work. So, dear participants, uh, if uh, you have any questions, please raise your hand and we will give you the mic uh, once you have a raised hand. So, uh, I was listening to the presentation, it was very interesting, and I have a couple of questions. Quite often, we hear from our colleagues in different countries about the shortage of staff. They say that there is a lack of uh, palliative care professionals. And so if you could, um, maybe you would give us some overview. How were you searching for the professionals for your center and how will you do this in the future? Because I'm sure that you will extend your stuff. And I'm also very interested in the experience of Nurbek and Shirin. How did you actually make this transfer to the palliative care area? Maybe we can start with Natalia Sava or maybe with Sabela. Yes, so Sabela will start. Well, indeed, you are absolutely right saying that we do have this staff shortage in our country as well as um, we can see it in many other countries. In Kazakhstan today, we don't have the official profession as the palliative care doctor. We don't have it. That's why Natalia for us is a unique professional in Kazakhstan. And for us, it's... Um, it's great that she agreed to stay with us and to work to establish our foundation. We also involved uh, Natalia in drafting the roadmap uh, for the children's palliative care or pediatric palliative care. We introduced Natalia to the representatives of the Ministry of Healthcare in Kazakhstan. We really wanted to communicate the information because we need to understand how to actually build the structure and model of this uh, care, because there is such an experience in Russia and in Belarus. And in Kazakhstan, it's quite difficult, even in terms of the legislative basis, because we don't have such an experience. But Natalia does have this knowledge very structured one, very clear one. When you talk to a person, you understand that it's already established. It's already there. We don't need to invent the wheel. And Natalia is the person who can give us, uh, give us this experience. And today, now we are talking to the uh, rectors of medical universities in Kazakhstan at the level of uh, vice rectors, at the level of the heads of the departments, heads of uh, chairs in medical universities. Because we are talking about training nurses and doctors in palliative care. We would like to establish this um, narrow field of palliative care. And so sometimes we are successful with these negotiations, sometimes we are not that successful, but we do have a vision that we have to integrate this profession in Kazakhstan, I mean the palliative care doctor, but of course, like it's 
always very slow and uh, very difficult. But uh, when you keep talking about the importance that uh, it's very needed, then uh, we will get some results, I'm sure. And we introduced Natalia to the heads uh, of uh, the universities. And uh, just a couple of days, we will have an offline meeting. Just recently, we had an online meeting. We already organized the webinars on the continuous development of our doctors. And our dream is to train doctors uh, and nurses in the field of uh, palliative care. And uh, I hope that we will make it happen. And in general, well, we also have to search for some professionals in the neighboring areas, such as uh, the um, resuscitators, anesthesiologists and rehabilitologists. Um, they can just get trained and then they can implement this knowledge in their work. And so now I'd like to give the floor to Natalia. Thank you. Yes, Sibylla, thank you very much. Well, um, there is um, indeed uh, there are no specialists, but uh, it's the case um, for every country. Everybody is uh, hungry for such professionals. And uh, people that um, came to us for an interview, they were nice uh, and good, but uh, they didn't really match with uh, our expectations because some people were saying that, oh, you know, I'm afraid of uh, palliative children uh, because I'm I feel very sorry for him and uh, for them. When Nurbek said um, that he's ready to offer help, uh, we understood that, oh, he's, uh, he's our person. Because, um, of course, uh, one needs to be able to work with the children in palliative care. Then I also sent Nurbek um, tons of literature and articles. He wasn't scared and he said, yes, okay, so I'll read all this. So I brought all the books uh, from my office uh, to his office and I see that he's reading them. In addition to that, we also discuss uh, a lot and I see that he's ready to learn it's very important and of course it's quite significant and important to be a kind person because palliative care is about kindness is uh, about caring and um, when we talk to some doctors um, we understand that for some of them it's very important to take care of their families and uh, that, that's how we understand that this person um, is a good member of our team for the creation of the center. That's how we actually were working in this respect. Thank you very much, Natalia. Great uh, comments on what you pay attention to while you are doing the interviews. Nurbek, maybe you could add something. Um, how did you actually come into the field of palliative care? Well, it was very nice. Um, for me interesting and uh, it's uh, very nice for me to work for our foundation now margisen so i like to talk to patients to children to parents even if they are in the crisis situations, even if they're in hospitals, I visit them in hospitals to offer consultations to doctors that treat them in those hospitals. I train them how to take care of these children. If there is any necessity in respiratory support or any other kind of support, and our doctors in Kazakhstan, usually resuscitators, they find it difficult to take care and to treat um, these patients. They don't know what to do. For example, children with asthma, for example, if there is a crisis situation, then they activate oxygen straight away. I used to do it myself before I work with resuscitators. And then I did not know that I was trained because oxygen is counterindicated for such children. Oxygen by itself, I mean, it can only be done with support. 
support of artificial lung ventilation. I trained them and now it works that way. They're getting trained, trained gradually. I receive new knowledge here. I get trained. Natalia Nikolaevna shares her knowledge as well. She shares books. I read books as well. And I get improved in my knowledge. Norbeck, sounds like you are ready to change your approach to switch from the one you were trained in in your medical university to something which is opposite. I understand very well the example that you explained with oxygen support. And it is quite crucial knowledge that all anesthesiologists use. And it's great that you are ready to get retrained and actually make that 180 turn, change your approach to such patients. There is a great question in the chat to all professionals, not only to our speakers, but to our listeners as well. Please don't be shy and share your experience. The question is the following. If you remember the moment when you got to a palliative care field, how comfortable did you feel? Or maybe it was psychologically difficult for you. Maybe you need support with that. Can you please share your memories, your feelings, both speakers and listeners? For example, Tatiana, she was with us at last webinar and Pavel Bondarevich as well. I invite you to take part in this discussion. Yes, initially it was difficult for me when I just started to work. I had never heard about some diagnosis before. As for others, I had seen them in my hospital. I knew how to work with them pretty, pretty much. But initially it was difficult for me to work with such children. Then I learned to do that. I learned to work with such children. I learned how to behave, how to manage treatment for those children, how to speak to parents. I got trained and I'm still getting trained. Good luck to you in that. Does anyone else want to add something based on the experience? You can raise your hand and we will activate your microphone, the possibility to turn on your microphone. There are a couple more questions in the chat that I would like to read. A question to those who will want to answer. Which formats of parent training are they in the format now? As far as I understand, there are individual consultations, which are quite lengthy. When you come to patient's home and parents get to your center, it is very detailed. However, maybe there are group formats, maybe there are video instructions, or are you just planning to do all of that? I will take this one. We started with two formats. Individual training on the child and school format. So two formats run in parallel. And schools always provide general theoretical knowledge. Parents, just like professionals, they are present there and they listen. And all the information we provide at the school, it is adapted for parents. We use very simple words. We try to make information available for professionals who haven't worked with that before to understand that. For example, professionals of pri primary link that come to us. And secondly, for this information to be clear for parents, it is the minimum of terms, it is short sentences, and short, clear, and precise information on the topic that, you, that, that we communicate. But still, mostly it is individual training. And usually one parent goes through many consultations. They have this possibility to get signed up for 10 consultations if they, if, if they wish. 
it's just important to get signed up actually. And in two hours, we select a topic. For example, today we only speak about respiratory support. There is a lot of information. You know, it is uh, SMA, uh, smart families, and there is another foundation as well. There is information there. There is also information about uh, myodystrophy, uh, Duchenne's my myodystrophy. So it's not us who came up with which information to provide. Uh, we are grateful uh, to those foundations because they have already shared that information with us. And now when we have a child with uh, Duchenne myodystrophy, we give them some information depending on uh, their stage, whether they can walk or not, whether it is inpatient or outpatient, and then we train them in what they need to know and which examinations that they need to go through. So each consultation is lengthy, and usually it is a specific topic, and each specific topic requires a specific consultation, it's a separate consultation. Right, so as schools that you spoke about during your presentation, both professionals and parents have access to them, right. That's great. It wasn't included in the presentation, but I think that it's something very important. Caregivers or parents or professionals as well, maybe nannies. Thank you. Another question from the chat. Are there volunteers in the center? If not, are you planning to resort to volunteers? Which competences may be needed for that and how to become a volunteer in your center? I will answer. I cannot say that there are volunteers specifically in the center. No, there is no need for that. Patients come to the center as if it was visit, visiting a doctor. But generally, in the center, in the foundation, yes, we have volunteers that we engage in events. For example, we are planning a big school in August with people attending in person. Our patients will come to that event from different towns in person. We have planned a re relaxation zone in a very picturesque place in Almaty region in the mountains. And we are thinking in advance where we can accommodate our patients, what conditions are available there. And we understand that as it will be a school, we will need to train parents separately. Together with children, there will be psychologists there. There will be doctors. It will be relevant to do it with children in some places, and children's presence won't be relevant in other places. And in those moments, we will need volunteers that will stay with children while caregivers will be busy with other activities. And when we hold other events, such as concerts or meetings, when there are volunteers or animators, people who can help physically, who can help and communicate and talk, that's great. However, we don't have volunteers that work permanently and that file in a request. We don't have that. In Kazakhstan, we have volunteer organizations, youth organizations. That work in different events. And if we have such a necessity, we contact those organizations to have volunteers for a, for a specific event. Otherwise, of course, we need volunteers or some online work. And as we have already said, often the parents themselves help. Parents themselves and parents of other children are often volunteers themselves. As for permanent volunteer service or department in the foundation, no, we don't have it for the moment. All right, that's clear. Thank you. We have one more question. 
It is very important. I guess it concerns everyone. It concerns all the specialists. Can you please speak in more detail how you found financing for the center? So it was found, the center is operating now, but I guess you have horizon of financial planning. Can you please tell us about that in more detail? Yes, of course. At the dawn of the foundation's existence, it was very difficult in terms of financing. We're a patient organization and we were interested ourselves in existence and in, de and in developing of the foundation of awareness work, telling people that such a foundation existed. We invite, invited different doctors and we often financed it ourselves. We had internal fundraise, fundraising assured by parents when we did not have enough money for events and when we did not find sponsors. We pulled in ourselves and sometimes we paid for uh, tickets for doctors and so on. And today there is already a big list of organiza organizations that help us. And it is due to specificities of work of our foundation. It is neuromuscular diseases. It is mostly due to the fact that there is treatment for patients with neuromuscular diseases. And the biggest weight is comes from pharmaceutical companies. There are medicines for spinal muscular uh, atrophy for Duchenne atrophy. We understand that multidisciplinary approach in treatment means not only receiving the medicine, it is not something that solves all the problems in a patient's treatment. We need that. We also need rehabilitation and respiratory support. And there are many areas, many ways to support families. And farm companies need to understand that as well. For patients to live a long life and for them to be their clients, then they need to maintain that quality of life. We motivate. We do such requests. There where it is necessary, we do presentations where we speak about why they need this help, where it will be directed. And then we write projects in advance. For example, like with Center of Genetic Consultation. First, we found a person, Natalia Nikolaevna, He's like a locomotive of that project. And very often, when we don't have such a specialist, it's difficult to describe the project itself, what is needed for that, what we need to take into, into account, which specialist, which equipment will be needed. And if there is a specialist who will describe everything correctly, we try to describe the project correctly and to take into account everything, to include everything in it. And then we make applications. And then sponsors and charitable organizations, they consider it. Sometimes they provide full sum of money. Sometimes they ask questions and they reduce the sum of money we asked for. But it's important that there is the main donor for the project and then missing materials or equipment or consumables, money for travel. We cover all of that with our smaller sponsors, not pharmaceutical companies, but companies that are generally there for help. We come to them with smaller requests to improve the help that we provide. Of course, our dream is to have a very strong fundraising department. I am being trained in that now as well. We received experience from St. Petersburg Foundation, thanks to Natalia Nikolaevna who had some experience exchange. And we understand that it should be an organization. We need to have something like a sales department in big companies. We need to have head of it, 
And we need to have managers that work in different areas. Maybe somebody works with small companies, others work with big business, others work with the state, maybe. And when there are state grants or grants from big state companies, work with those grants. Now we have a very small fundraising department. I'm the only one, basically. Sometimes Natalia Nikolaevna helps. There are the foundation coordinators. Everyone does their own thing. Some people write letters, others hold meetings. That is what we have for the moment. Fundraising, you know, when you know what you need money for, when you know which project it is about, then you will definitely find that money. You will be sure to find it. Thank you very much. It's a small but very effective department based on what huge activities you're running. And now you definitely have what to show the results you have achieved in the last year. You have what to show to your sponsors. I'm sure that you will succeed. Good luck in that. Thank you very much. Dear listeners, if you have more questions, please ask them. You can raise your hand or you can write your question in the chat. I will wait for 10 seconds. There may be a delay of, of sound. I'm waiting for signals from you and for your comments. Well, if you don't have any questions, then I want to thank our distinguished speakers once again. Thank you hugely for having joined, for participating in this event, for having shared information about your work. That is a huge value for us. Your experience is so valuable, and I will get back to you, and we will collect useful materials as follow-up of our webinar, and we will pass them on to all professionals who did not manage to join. Thank you very much to PACE team. I will enumerate. I will present again my colleagues that helped in organizing of this event. It wouldn't have been possible without them. It is Anastasia Guleyeva, Ksenia Pamenova, Alex Pintabakirisa, Roman Sklotsky, Elena Lvova. Our interpreters, simultaneous interpreters, that we don't hear in Russian, but they are interpreting in English in parallel. They are Anna Akmaeva and Anastasia Pelega. A huge thank you to our listeners, those who have managed to join today, despite an early hour there where they are. I want to remind you that we have a paste chat for specialists, for professionals, and my colleagues will now send the link once again, a link to Google form to become part of that chat. We collect a monthly news digest on our website, and on the website of Paste Foundation, you'll, you will be able to subscribe to monthly newsletter that you will receive on your email, in your email box. I think that very useful and interesting materials are presented there that broaden our professional scope of knowledge a lot. Now, volunteer help. On the 3rd of August, we'll run our next webinar, a webinar in a series of meetings for palliative care professionals. This webinar will be devoted to volunteering and non-medical palliative care in hospice facilities or in palliative care units. Not all specialists have ever faced non-medical palliative care, I guess. They don't always imagine what specifically is part of it. 
and specialists in medical facilities and personnel may be very busy and they always need extra hands and they always need volunteer help. And my colleague Felix will speak about that, how to organize it, how to bring in volunteers and how to work with them for their help to be as effective as possible. We're also interested in your opinion on this webinar. We try to improve ourselves. My colleagues will now send a link in the chat, a link to a very short Google form. Please open it in a separate tab in your browsers. And please pay one minute, please devote one minute of your time to it. Here it is, feedback form. Please get back to it and fill it in, maybe today over the day. It is very important for us because we want to get better and we want the knowledge that we pass on and we want the events that we organize to be as effective as and as interesting as possible for you. Thank you very much. I'm sure that we will see each other very soon. Thanks a lot and bye. Thank you very much, Irina and all the PACE team. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And thank you for the work that you're doing. You're doing it very professionally, with high professionalism. It's very interesting, it's very modern, it's very dynamic. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, we try to do our best. Good luck in your work. Best of luck. Let you succeed in everything. And organizations that want to help build this palliative care in their country, their region. I hope that they will be lucky. I wish them luck in all their projects. My sincere best wishes to you. All the best. Thank you very much. Thank you. All the best to you as well. Thank you very much. Goodbye.